Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today was adopted at birth and raised in New York City. Although he knew for most of his life that he was adopted, it wasn't until he approached his 70th birthday that he began to search for the identity of his birth mother. His journey and the many surprising discoveries he made as he searched are now recounted in his memoir, The Gift Best Given. He and his wife now live in Hillsborough, North Carolina, and he's a popular book club presenter. The Gift Best Given is his first full-length book. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Edward D. Ganji. Hi, Julia. How are you? Thank you very much for the invitation to join you. Edward, our opening question is always, what took you so long to write your first book? Well, as you said, it did take quite a long time. I, I didn't start this until I approached my 69th birthday. And, uh, you know, I, I've had a blessed life and an interesting life, but it was not until I decided to delve into this story that I thought I had a big enough story that really really warranted a book. And I, I wasn't even sure then. I started to, to accumulate some essays, uh, memoirs about my search, and it just kept on growing from there. And at a given point, I just said, well, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll make this a book. And 350 pages later, yes, it is. <laughs> Well, you and I both share the adoption journey, and you waited a long time to begin your first identity search. What finally initiated it? Well, interestingly, uh, my wife's parents had come down to live with us in North Carolina. And sadly, within a year, both of them, both of them had arrived in somewhat compromised health. And within a year, both of them had passed away. And we were up in New Jersey where they had come from to inter my father-in-law's remains. And coincidentally, not very far away was a cemetery where my adoptive mother's family was largely interred. And given few opportunities to visit, we went over there and I was, I was standing over the grave of my adoptive mother's parents. And Thought, you know, it'd be interesting to kind of dig in and find out where it was they came from. I knew they were they were from Ukraine, and this was before Ukraine really became the subject that it is today. And so I, I started a little bit of research, and when I realized how easy, and I say easy in, in quotations, it was to start coming up with some substantial information about them, I thought... You know, I, I'm adopted. I've always known I've been adopted. I've never delved into it. If it's this easy to find information on, on my adoptive family, let me see what I can find on my biological family. And that's, that's where the search began. Does your memoir concentrate um, exactly on the adoption angle of your life, or does it include any more of your childhood? Uh, by and large, it, it starts with my search at the age of 69, and it, it mixes two pieces together. One is the memoir, the, the journey that I went on and what I discovered. And then I found myself writing a fairly good piece of, I guess, what I would have to call creative nonfiction, telling the story of my birth mother. 
and what I discovered there. And, and I say it's creative nonfiction in that I know precisely where she was, when she was, and who she was with. Obviously, I don't know what was said in those in those instances. So I've, I've created dialogue. I've created thought to the best of my ability to, I think, make it just as authentic as possible, possibly it can be. So it, it interleaves the two, my journey and and her life from the the time she left home at the age of 17. And I, I should step back quickly. I I discovered that my birth mother had been a celebrity in the big ice skating shows in the 1940s and the 1950s. So I trace her journey from the time she left home in 1942 at the age of 17 to the time that she placed me for adoption in May of 1948. That's a very interesting premise. I like that you use both of those together. Um, I searched and found my um, birth mother and then through the DNA results much later, my birth father's family and my birth father had passed away, but I got to know uh, him through a first cousin. And so those DNA results are opening lots of lots of doors for people. And you have to be careful and make sure that you really want to walk through. There are no secrets anymore. There are absolutely no secrets. And you and I have a similar path. I, I did a DNA test simply to find out what my heredity was, you know, where I originated from. And in the process, I found my birth father's identity and I found a half brother. You know, so there there are no secrets. And, you know, unfortunately, he was my half brother was just excited as heck to find me and and we've had a lovely relationship since. That's great. I, I love when that works out and it's a good situation, but I try to tell adoptees that you have to prepare. You know, it may not be a good situation. There are uh, those who want to remain hidden and secrets are still there in the families and you just have to be prepared when you when you conduct a search. Yeah, that, as I said, there are no secrets. And, you know, some of the answers, as you said, are very, very happy. Some of the outcomes are, you know, are, are very frustrating and, and, and rather sad. Yeah. Well, Edward, once you wrote this book, how did you proceed? Did you search for an agent, decide to choose a hybrid, a small press, or did you self-publish? Well, I was kind of all over the map. My initial thought was I would give it to a publisher, get a big advance, and and move on from there. So I, I queried 80 different agents. And out of those 80 agents, I believe I got three responses. Two of them saying, send us a little bit more. And a, the third one saying, send me the manuscript. And none of them ever responded again. I then talked with a couple of hybrid publishers and I yeah, I looked at that from a business standpoint. I looked at the books that they had published, and I looked at the cost of of sharing publication expenses with them, and in the end decided I could do just as well self-publishing and that I could put out an equal product at a cost that was less, and that would return greater royalties to me. Yeah, I, as much as I would have liked to have stayed on the traditional publishing route, you know, at the age of 70, I was thinking, you know, this life is too short, you know, to chase down the publisher and then to go into a process of, of getting that book out into the world, which is oftentimes two and three years once it's accepted. Well, those are the exact decisions that most of us at this age make. And we uh, don't want to wait all those years and hope for the best with just a few large publishing houses out there who are taken over by the number of requests that they have every year. Absolutely. I've, I've, I've heard that more than a million titles are published in the U S every year. That, that doesn't surprise me a bit. Doesn't surprise me a bit. Actually, I heard a number recently and I, I think it was from the random house recent trial to, as they were trying to do a merger that, they were saying that there are 58,000 books that go out into the public, and this is from traditional publishing each year, and less than a dozen of them 
or I'm sorry, less than 25% of those books ever sell more than 12 copies. And you look at that and say, why bother? It's stunning. <laughs> those those statistics are just stunning. Yeah, yeah. And, yep, so you can go and you can self-publish and put a book out there that is the equal of any traditionally published book. And then it's up to you to make sure that it's it's seen by you by your potential readership. We have so many options today that, that writers did not have just a few years ago. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I think those options are getting broader. Were you always a writer? What was your other career and, and how did you learn your craft to write this book? I had a, uh, my professional career was largely in the customer service industry. And I, I was typically in leadership roles in inbound telephone call centers. So we were not the people who would call you at dinner time. Uh, you know, we were the people who you call to make reservations on airlines or to set up telephone service or television service. And, you know, in doing so, I, I was responsible for leading large groups of people. The, the largest group I had was, I believe, 1,400 people under one roof. And so a good part of communication there depends on, on writing skills. And, you know, there are people who would probably tell you that some of my writing skills to them was creative. But, you know, you, you want to go out and you want to be able to uh, communicate facts and communicate requirements and, uh, you know, communicate expectations. So there was there was a lot of writing like that. In between, I did. I had a little bit of time for varied interests and I did some uh, some small journal articles, you know, one for Appaloosa horse breeding, one for fly fishing. So I, I've been kind of all over the map. Well, that's kind of the way my journey was as well. I, I was in public relations and marketing and, of course, mm -hmm. writing press releases and speeches for presidents of universities is a whole different ball game from fiction. So when yes. I <laughs> when I got ready to write my first book, I had to kind of relearn my techniques. It's interesting. I have employees who tell you, you know, some of my communications in fiction were not too far off. <laughs> I, I tend to think they I, I tend to think they're pretty factual, though. Do you write every day? What is your writing routine? Are you still writing? When I was writing uh, the gift best given, I was I was very, very diligent and I was writing every day. I would I would like to say I'm doing that now. I tend to go down rabbit holes and get easily distracted, but I'm trying very hard. I'm working on a sequel to The Gift Best Given, and so I'm working very hard to get a, a small piece done each day. And I think that's a, it's a critical piece of information for aspiring authors is come up with some sort of a writing practice, sit your butt in a seat, and put something on paper. Absolutely. That's most important, I think. And some of us, after we finish writing those books, we kind of take a breather and we need to get back to it. <laughs> I've, I've, I've taken too long a breather. <laughs> and we lose our momentum. Yeah, I've actually, I've gotten a little bit down rabbit holes with some, some creative writing, you know, not related to the book, just, just essays and and things like that. And you, know, you get involved with those and then it takes you away from what your main goal was. But in its own way, that's a that's a refreshing thing, too. It gives you another look at your writing, at, at your writing practice and skills. And so many of us can fall down those rabbit holes in doing research as well. Yeah, that's that's certainly the case. And I love to do research. So you can get just way, way far away from your writing, just trying to find out, you know, how long it took to take a train from New York City to Cleveland. And I certainly did that with the gift best given. My mother did a lot of travel initially by train. I could tell you every stop along the way from New York to, to Vancouver, British Columbia. And probably about those ice skating shows as well. 
Absolutely. So absolutely. Fortunately, it's, you know, that's been one of the wonderful things with having written the book is it's, it's put me in touch with a couple of different communities and just built wonderful personal relationships. One is that ice skating community. And there are, there are still people who, you know, who remember my mother and come from that same, same era. And the other is, yeah, it's the adoption community, which I, I really didn't look very hard at as I initially started to write and then to publicize the book. But, you know, I realized there are a lot more people affected by adoption than there are by ice skating. It's a huge community. There are a hundred million Americans who have adoption in their immediate families. Yeah. Yeah. One way or another, we're, we're touched very closely. You don't have to go very far. No. You know, I always tell the story that when I when my book was first published, the first thing I did was go to my local bookstore. And it's a it's a wonderful independent bookstore here in Hillsborough. And I walked in with copies in hand, hoping to to get them on the shelf there and had the conversation with a lady who owns the store. And, and we talked a little bit. And and then she said, you know, I don't know if you know or not, but I was adopted. And we had a conversation around that. And then, you know, it's a small enough town that you can leave her store across the street without getting run down in traffic. Went over to the coffee shop directly opposite and found a, an acquaintance who, you know, I was not particularly close with, but the relationship was growing. And I said, well, I was just across the street at the bookstore. And, you know, and I was told that, you know, the owner there was adopted. And, you know, and the person I was talking to looked at me and she said, not many people know this, but when I was a teenager, I gave up a baby for adoption. So, you know, those are two conversations and two people touched by adoption very closely. That has been my favorite part of writing my first book is all of the adoptees who reached out, the birth mothers, all of the the adoptive parents, you know, just this huge community and and every one of them touched so differently and we have so many different perspectives on the subject but it it's become quite a hot button issue these days and and very interesting to hear from so many different people yeah it really has it's very much like that dna issue is as you delve into it there are there are people like myself who feel they were blessed by being placed by adoption for adoption and other people who are just terribly fractured and hurt by the experience. And yeah, none of us are right or wrong with that. It's, you know, it's all personal experience, but, you know, for, for better or for worse, here we all are. Does your family support your career as a writer? Sometimes writing memoir can, can be a touchy subject in families. You know, it was very interesting. I, I, you, you read in the beginning, and I, I stated again, that I knew from a very young age I was adopted, but I never, ever recall my parents mentioning it to me. No one sat me down and said, you were adopted. I, I kind of accidentally found out. And when I found out, I thought, if nobody has talked about this, then I guess it's not for me to question. So I, I sort of went on, and I, when the book... Uh, was published was the first time I kind of confronted cousins with the fact that, you know, what did you know, or did you know? And, and as the book went out, I got, I got two calls from cousins immediately saying, we always knew you were adopted. You know, I'm so sorry we didn't tell you. And in, in the writing of the book, I had uh, my eldest cousin who sadly is no longer alive. And she was very, very close to my adoptive parents. And I was afraid you know, that I was going to offend her by it, just by the fact that I was you know, telling the story. But I decided to call her up one day and just out of the blue, I said, Anne, what can you tell me about my adoption? And I kind of expected this gasp and her to step back. And she never missed a beat. She said, I only know two things about your adoption. Is One is that your mother was an ice skater. And two is that my mother went with your parents to pick you up when you were a day old at the hospital. And, and, you know, it was very matter of fact. And then a couple of weeks later, she called me back with one more thing. And she said, I just remembered it. You were named after so-and-so. 
because he was a big part of arranging your adoption. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, the secret that I thought was out there wasn't much of a secret and it didn't seem to offend anybody. And, you know, I, I think more people are interested by the story than have been, uh, than had reservations about it. Well, and over the years, I think there's so many stories even around our adoptions or um, what we were assumed to be genetically. I was always told that I was part Native American, that my great grandmother was Cherokee. And so I had this identity that I'm Native American. But when I did the DNA kit, I found out that I'm half Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> The, the Native American thing seems to be a traditional adoption adoption story. What I found out when I did my DNA is I'm a third Jewish, and you know I'm largely Eastern European on on both sides, and there's some Northern Northern European in there, but it's yeah, you know, it's about thirty or thirty five percent Jewish. And I tell the story in the book that I had a a high school girlfriend who was Jewish and her mother always was saying, she would just look at me and say, you're such a nice boy. It's a shame you're not Jewish. <laughs> and, you know, and I, it didn't bother me. It bothered my girlfriend much more. And, you know, and then later on, you know, it's like, I said, I wonder if a third would have been enough. <laughs> That's so fun. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the passages you've brought to share today and then read uh, from your book so we can hear the tone and voice in there. Yeah, I do have a short passage for you. And just to set the scene a little bit, uh, my mother at the age of 22 had reached celebrity status with the big ice skating shows. And she returned to New York City unmarried and unexpectedly pregnant. She came from a very traditional, conservative, Polish Catholic family and she, you know, this is 1948, decided that that would bring nothing but shame on the family and on her. And she decided that she was going to manage her pregnancy in secrecy. And the only people who ever knew about this were her eldest sister, who was about 12 years older, and her sister's husband. So the husband took a very paternal role in, in, in assisting her and supporting her and found for her a, a hospital in New York City that, that really did exist and no longer does. And, but they dealt with people in show business and in the public eye who needed discretion. So she went to this hospital to manage her pregnancy there. In the course of that, she was befriended by a, a member of the administrative staff, Mrs. Blumenthal, who in this in the story assumes rather a maternal role toward her. She she fills in in the motherly role that Genevieve could not have because she didn't share this with her parents. So this this short passage comes after immediately after hearing her baby's my heartbeat for the first time. The lady at the desk in the lobby, Mrs. Blumenthal, the nurse had said, looked up as Genevieve stepped off the elevator and announced, unprompted, in the voice of someone trying to comprehend unexpected news, I just heard my baby's heartbeat. Mrs. Blumenthal smiled and she motioned, motioned her to the velvet upholstered chair beside her desk. Making no assumptions as to what Genevieve's response might be, she asked a reassuring sound, I imagine, Miss Narowski. Genevieve, please, my name is Genevieve. She felt a need to share, and she could not do that with someone who addressed her as Miss Narowski. I didn't expect it. I hadn't thought about it. I should have. Genevieve stared at the lilac sitting on the credenza in their yellow Chinese porcelain vase. Hearing her baby's heartbeat had been as unexpected as seeing lilacs in January. Now you truly know you're not alone, Mrs. Blumenthal smiled. Such a gift to be given on a day like this, she continued, studying Genevieve, who was lost in thought. I don't know. Genevieve sounded as if she was trying to decide whether or not this truly was the case. My skating, my career, that was the gift I was given. And now this, 
I don't know that I can have them both. I don't know how to choose between them. Life is about choices, Genevieve, what you do with your life, what you do with your gifts. Mrs. Blumenthal spoke softly and slowly. Then she continued, this is not always a world of convenient answers and simple solutions. Genevieve listened, then she stood up to put on her coat. That's what I told Dr. Cerisi when he first told me that I was going to have a baby, that there were no easy answers. The two walked toward the doors. The heat in the lobby had fogged the glass, so only the silhouettes of passing cars and pedestrians on the other side were visible. When Mrs. Blumenthal opened the door to allow Genevieve out, both saw that the snow had stopped. She turned to Genevieve and placed a gentle hand on her shoulder. You are strong and you are brave and you are not alone. The answer to what to do about your gifts will come to you. Genevieve smiled an unconvinced smile as she said goodbye and stepped out onto the sidewalk. She had taken only a few steps when she heard Mrs. Blumenthal call after her. She returned and took a step back toward the hospital's entrance. Her new friend, this person in whom she confided thoughts she had not shared with anyone else, said to her, sometimes Genevieve, the best gift is the gift that you give to another. Wiping the condensation off the glass door away with her fingers, Mrs. Blumenthal watched as Genevieve disappeared around the corner onto Lexington Avenue. It's very poignant. Yeah, and Mrs. Yeah, Genevieve had had choices to make, and you know, and she she was given lots of options. This was kind of, as I said, a private hospital that 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 offered things. She was given the option of terminating the pregnancy. She had the option of going home and being embarrassed with her parents, sticking me in a knapsack and going back to the ice shows. And yeah, and she, she ultimately made the decision to, to place me for adoption. And it goes back to that line of sometimes the gift, best gift is the gift that you give. Well, not many women in those times had had so many options. Yes, yeah, she was a very, she was a privileged woman. She had the resources, both financially and and in care, and she, you know, she had the the maturity, I think, and the strength to say, "I'm going to do this on my own, and I will make ultimately make the decision that makes the best sense." and And I, I just feel so terribly blessed by that. Edward, were there any specific books or seminars or writing retreats or groups that you can share? that improved your writing journey? Um, one that, ins that helped inspire the writing the book was a book that I read by a man by the name of Daniel Mendelssohn. And he wrote a book called The Lost. And it was his search for six relatives who had perished during the Holocaust. And I, I had read his book, I think three or four times just because it was that interesting. And it was not about the Holocaust, but it was about his search, which took him over five continents. And I, I was just so inspired by his, his persistence and his methodology. I said, if he can do that, I can certainly chase down the identity of my birth mother. Uh, as far as the writing itself, I became a member of a, a writing group here in, in, in nearby Chapel Hill. And I'll be going over there this afternoon to read with them again. Another at a library in, in another town not too far away. And both of those were just wonderful opportunities because, number one, they almost force you to show up with something in hand. If, if you're lazy, you still can't go there unless you've got something to read. You can, be a, you can be a spectator only for so long. So it created some discipline. And the other pieces, you get wonderful feedback. You get to listen to other people's writing and you get to hear what people think about your writing. And that was real valuable. My other association that I've had that I think has been very valuable is I'm a, a member of the North Carolina Writers Network. And our, our chapter here in Orange County has a monthly meeting, always on some varied subject. And the conference itself or the network itself has a a spring one day conference and then an autumn two and a half day conference, which is very informative and, and you can take a variety of classes there. 
You said you have another book in you that you're going to do a sequel. Where does it pick up and where will it lead? My mother, after she placed me for adoption, within months was, well, within a month, it was back ice skating. And within three months was back with a group called Ice Vogues, which was a touring company where she ultimately wound up skating in the Caribbean and South America and then across Europe before returning to the United States to skate with Holiday on Ice. So, uh, yeah, she had a real interesting life. She be, she ultimately married in 1955. She and her husband had their first child in 1956. So the, the book will go from the time she resumes her ice skating up to the time she finds out she's pregnant with her first child. And... The book is is meant to do two things. Number one, and I'm calling it, for lack of a better title right now, a an unreliable diary. It it's going to be a combination of my prose juxtaposed with diary entries from my mother. And I think what I found in the course of writing this first book is the strength and the sacrifice that a birth mother makes and you know and what i learned is that you know a mom doesn't give away a child and forget it and go on with life i think they go on with life but they never forget so these diary entries will continue you know her relationship with me and you know and what what adoption meant to her what that relinquishment meant to her so it's it's a combination of 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 travels and experiences and, and her thoughts along with them. That sounds great. Well, Edward, as always, our last interview question is our writers over 50 are quite a unique set. Do you have any advice for writers 50 and above? I think one of the great benefits they had were those two writing groups that I joined. And I would suggest that if you've got thoughts about writing or you started and you're not sure, go find some group that's you know that you feel comfortable with, and and put yourself out there. Yeah, I think what you'll find is you'll get some constructive feedback as you listen to other people. If you've got doubts about yourself, you listen to some other people's and say, "Gee, mine's not all that bad after all." You know, and it's if you've got a story, tell it, you know, start putting it on paper and and then go find a, a supportive environment for yourself. It's a it's a tough business to do on your own because you're you're filled with self-doubt. Inevitably, you're filled with self-doubt. I'm I'm going to my group today with two of these diary entries and and, you know, and I, I go there, I go there every two weeks, but I'm still worried about what will they think about you know, what I'm bringing today. And, and inevitably, you usually get positive feedback and you get very constructive feedback. So go find somebody to help you with this process. You know, it's a tough one to do alone. That's so true. I, I think this is such a humbling industry. And I, I find writers to be such a generous group and a, and a wonderful community to be involved with. So we just appreciate your being with us today to offer your journey. And I'm so excited that you and I are kindred spirits on the adoption journey as well. We certainly are. And I thank you so much for your time today. And we're excited to say that you're now one of our authors over 50. Julia, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you. It's been great. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.